Alright, welcome back to Honored Madman, and today we're going to be talking about what I consider the rarest equipment in the game. It's mostly all weapons, but there's a few armor pieces that are definitely worth mentioning. And these items are rare, not because there's only like one of them in the game or something like that. The kind of stuff you'd see in your garden variety RPG. No. These are more MMO style rare in that they just have these really painfully low drop rates. But there's a number of these items in the game and I figured it'd be worth documenting them since I spent all this time trying to farm them. So starting with the rare armor pieces because style tends to be valued as higher than strength when it comes to Dark Souls games. This first item gets points because I didn't even know it existed until like last week. But it's the octopus head. It's quite literally a whole land octopus that you could wear as a helmet. I don't know how I missed this thing because it's only dropped by smaller land octopuses and I've killed innumerable of them in my many playthroughs of Elden Ring. So I found it strange that I had never uh, encountered this item. It's not dropped at all by the larger ones. And a great place to farm for it would be right by the Saints Bridge at that little mini lake, pond type thing. The little dragonfly bugs can get annoying after a while, but there's like eight or nine of these mini octopuses here, so it makes it a really great spot to farm, especially because there's a grace nearby. However, you could farm this place for hours and hours and come up empty handed, like with many things in this game. But unlike the majority of these items on the list, this one has a little exploit to help you get it faster. You didn't hear this from me, but if you happen to put on that song Ocean Man by the band Ween and have it on repeat while you're farming, you'll get the helmet within 10 minutes. In many videos, I've made fun of the Fextra Life pages and their comments, but this is the one time where the comments actually helped me out, so I gotta give credit where credit's due. They finally found a way to be helpful. But the octopus mask itself is actually a pretty cool piece of headgear. It almost gives you the appearance of one of those nightmare executioners or vicars of the cosmos as I believe they're called from Bloodborne. The Davy Jones galaxy faced guys with tentacle beards. And judging by its description, the octopus that makes up the octopus head appears to be still alive as it has the lingering warmth of human skin. It's also said that it smells but that its elasticity makes for great protection against strike damage. So if you want to run around with a stinky half-dead fish on your head and attempt to get closer to Cthulhu, look no further. Next in the armor section we've got the Aristocrat's Headband. Now this is another item I had no idea we could actually get until it dropped from an enemy I'd killed a million times in playthrough 5. So it's sort of like a gilded, bejeweled crown of sorts. Looks like it's got little rubies in it. It also looks a bit like the collars worn by the long fur dogs you see, employed by the foot soldiers of Rhea Lucaria and of Godric. But this thing is dropped by the noble sorcerers, the really annoying weak enemy who is sometimes strategically placed to snipe you. Some of them appear to possess a teleportation-like ability that leaves behind these gold specks or leaves after being used. This is an enemy that can be found all across the lands between in just about every region, except for the underground sections as far as I know. They can be found traveling with caravans or amongst their peers learning behind the locked doors of Rey Lucaria Academy. But I'd say the best place to farm for this extremely stylish piece of headwear would be at the King's Realm Ruins located directly south of Carrion Manor and right by E.G.'s Bonfire. Or Side of Grace, I don't know, I always call them bonfires, it's a habit. Even in Bloodborne, I could never be bothered to call them lanterns. Even though they kind of function differently, since you can't really rest at them. Anyway, I digress. There's a large number of these sorcerer nobles here. Eight, I think, to be exact. But they all operate the same way. They teleport in, use glitchstone pebble, teleport out before you can hit them. Or if you're fast enough, you do hit them and kill them in one hit because they're such weak enemies. But yeah, after a little bit of dedicated farming, this one shouldn't take that long at all. This next one, however, is a bit more difficult. Mainly because it's only dropped by two enemies in the entire game. I'm of course referring to the unaltered Banished Knight armor, which has the surcoat. I call it the Banished Knight coat. But this thing is only dropped by two spectral knights located in Castle Soul, deep in the mountaintops of giants. There are several Banished Knights that patrol this castle, but you can easily tell apart the ones that are wearing this unique armor set, as the others wear the altered version, which doesn't have the additional surcoat. One of these guys can easily be reached by taking the elevator up into the boss room but stepping off at the midpoint. 
where you'll find yourself on a rooftop of sorts, and right in front of you will be two alpha gray wolves and the banished knight you're seeking. So these ghostly banished knights are never really fun fights because they can teleport all over the place, and yeah, after a while you can start to predict them and read their movements, but it's never really a, a fun fight if you're going to spend a couple hours farming something. You don't really want to just go through this intense-ass fight every single time for fairies. No, you want to cheap shot them or kill them fast so you can go refresh the area and do it again. Elden Ring gives us many ways to pull off such things. My personal favorite is to lion's paw them into oblivion. Or if you're in a hurry, use the dragon communion breath attacks. Any one kind of will do. But there's also another one of these knights, and this one's a bit more difficult due to the fact that he's a red-eyed knight. Yep, straight out of Dark Souls 3 and other From Software games, we've got ourselves a red-eyed, overpowered knight that, would you look at that, dual wields great swords. Oh, and did I forget to mention that he can teleport? Yeah, so I've actually gotten him to teleport outside of the castle and fall down after I fell down too. And we had this whole long extended fight in front of the castle. That was pretty cool. But other than that, I really don't recommend fighting this guy. I don't think he drops anything unique besides the Serco, which again is a small, small chance. And he's kind of out of the way compared to the other one. Yeah, you can get to this one fairly fast too, but the other one is a much faster run. And I think it's really important to note that FromSoft could have just made the armor alterable like all the other armors besides the Prelate and a few other exceptions. But they didn't. They gave it to these two overpowered enemies in the late game and then slapped this low-ass drop rate on them for good measure. It's like they don't want us to have this armor for some reason. Kind of weird. I'm just kidding. I do think it's weird though like why they made this armor so difficult to get. It's even more annoying when you realize they show you this armor through Irena's dad, Edgar, at Castle Morn in the Weeping Peninsula early on. And you can fight Edgar in two fairly different encounters. The first is if you killed Irena, he'll show up in human form and attack you. And the other is at the Revenger's Shack. All you have to do is follow the corpses of Misbegotten into the shack and then he'll invade you. You kill him and he drops a Shabriri Grape. But no armor set. It's pretty whack. But that was the last entry for the armor section. There's a couple others I'll want to talk about when I get to the honorable mentions, but for now, those three were like the hardest armor pieces for me to get in the game. The weapons list is a bit longer. As a bonus entry on this list, I would like to bring in the Halig Tree Crest Great Shield. That's right, it actually exists. So this one almost didn't make it on the list, but thanks to some stormtrooper I ran into in a bathroom, I was reminded that this is actually a pretty hard item to get. On my first playthrough, I got this shield like the first time I ran through the Halig Tree. I don't think I ran through the uh, area it's found more than once. But when I saw it mentioned, I was like, okay, well, I'll go farm for it and see how hard it is to get. And it took me like several hours to get, so it's definitely deserving of being on this list. For whatever reason, it does not drop from the two Halig Tree Knights that are stationed near the Rotten Avatar, near the inner Elphael Grace Point. No, this elusive shield is only dropped by the knights at the bottom of the Halig Tree. When you step out of that pest-ridden Church of the Rot God, you have essentially two paths you could take. You can go left or you can go right. If you go left, there's a bunch of pests and lesser pests and it's really just not a whole lot of fun and to the right is a bunch of soldiers and that's right you guessed it a bunch of halig tree knights but these ones drop the shield to optimize the farming i would say that only the first one you see is worth killing since you could just fast travel back to the halig tree roots and then run right back to this guy fairly quickly and after a while it becomes second nature to dodge the pest threads used by the prawn sorcerers or servants of rot as they're also called but the first Halig Tree Knight is off in a corner and he's fairly easy to kill without alerting anybody. You can just go up and spam some kind of a weapon art or staggering attack on him and he's pretty much done for. I'm not big on shields, but as far as they go, this one looks as useful, if not more useful, than the other knight shields. And if nothing else, the rarity of it kind of makes it a status symbol. The coat of arms on the shield depicts the fabled Halig Tree, made with unalloyed gold, an invention of the fabled demigod Mikolas. It depicts the Halig Tree in all of its brilliance, but now, given the sorry state of the very same tree, I'd say, it leaves this wondrous rendition of fleeting fantasy, as opposed to objective reality. So these many great and formidable knights followed Mikola out here because they believed in his Halig Tree, a new world logic, to replace the bloated, exclusive, and corrupt Erd Tree. 
However, the true majesty of the Hallig Tree would never be realized because Mikula was stolen away from the Hallig Tree while he slept by an infamous demigod known as Mog, or the Lord of Blood, or 6ix9ine Takashi, whatever you want to call him. But he was stolen away before the Hallig Tree could finish growing, completely stunting its growth. And it looks like that after Melania was brought back by Clean Rot Knight Finley, after her disastrous battle with General Radon, that she too has left her mark on this once beautiful Hallig Tree, adding rot to the equation. The Hallig Tree in general is something I've seen a lot of other channels cover, so I didn't really uh, put it very high on my list, but it's something I'd really like to explore a little bit more. Anyway, moving on. Starting this one off with an entry I think we can all relate to, since it's quite possibly the rarest weapon in the game due to it dropping from only one enemy, even though there's other enemies that use it, first on this list is the Monk's Flame Blade. Before I get into the nitty gritty, I want to voice my nitty picky, and that is that this thing doesn't do any inherent bleed damage. Or bleed buildup, I mean. It's kind of goofy because they make this weapon so hard to get, and they give it this really cool chainsaw-like design, but it doesn't do any bleed buildup. It's just, uh, it's just a frustrating little nitpick I have. My other problem with it is that it's clearly wielded by the Black Flame Monk that's located beneath the Divine Tower in Kaelid, but it does not drop from the ashy bearded bastard. Making the annoyingly placed regular Flame Monk in the giant conquering hero's grave the sole place where you can obtain this weapon. It's kind of egregious how we encounter these monks at various points throughout the game. From Lyurnia to Gelmir to the mountaintops of giants, and yet none of those have the flame blade. They always just carry the mace instead. And it's not like the sword is particularly special or anything. It doesn't do any innate fire damage. It doesn't have any unique attacks. It has decent weight, that's for sure, and it'd probably be good to dual wield, but that would be a pain in the ass trying to farm for a second one. I will say that it has a pretty cool design. Like, it really looks like a weapon that would be used by an order of fire-worshipping warrior monks. See, originally they were the fire guardians, similar to the Erdtree guardians, except this particular group was appointed by America to watch over the Flame of Ruin and sort of guard it, if you will. But as the generations went by, this order eventually evolved into worshippers of this Flame of Ruin. And you guys know the rest. I did a whole video about it. It's pretty interesting. It might be one of my earlier ones, but I think it's uh, one of the ones that holds up the best. Anyway, moving on. And since we're on the subject of fire monks and flame guardians, let's talk about the thorn whip. I fucking hate this weapon. Not only is it not worth farming for, it's also outclassed by like every single other whip and doesn't even look the coolest out of all of them. I mean, sure, it looks cool if you're going for a certain type of, uh, vibe, but... So yeah, I'm not a fan of this weapon, but let's get into it anyway. Wielded only by the fire prelates, leaders of the fire monks who tend to resemble the owner of your local pizza shop, specifically it's only wielded by one of them, specifically the one near the bridge in the mountaintops of giants. Now the enemy's high health and the fact that he's accompanied by numerous thorn sorcerers make this sort of a, uh, not a particularly fun farm. And the weapon itself is cool visually. It was said to be a weapon of fearsome religious encouragement, crafted in the image of the Briars of Sin. The Briars are these sort of thorny vines worn by prisoners, as well as a blood-based sorcery that is employed by the criminals who serve as acolytes of the Fire Monks. Having been forced to wear these briars all over their body likely resulted in the creation of these sorceries, with a little help from the Blood Star, but I'll do a video on that later. It being described as an instrument of religious encouragement kind of tells me that the fire prelates use these whips to encourage these criminals into becoming better servants of the flame by whipping the shit out of them. It's very likely how they indoctrinated these criminals who became the thorn sorcerers into becoming fire monks and their servants. So there's definitely some pretty cool lore implications with this weapon, and that's a main reason I wanted to talk about it. Because yeah, it seems to be how the fire monks induct new members into their order. They take criminals and indoctrinate them into their religion, thus strengthening their number. The Golden Order probably ships a good majority of its criminals up to the mountaintops to serve at the Guardian's garrison. And yeah, the whip obviously does innate bleed buildup, and that's pretty cool, but so does the Hoslo Pedal Whip. And honestly, I'd rather use a bleed Urumi over this. It's just not an impressive weapon in my opinion. But to each their own. It does have some style. Moving on to the next one. We've got the Magma Blade, found only at Volcano Manor, wielded by two unique snake men. Luckily, the only two of these guys are fairly close together, but even then it can get a little tedious to farm. 
But unlike the previous entry on this list, this weapon is actually pretty goddamn viable. It's got solid damage and weight, the additional fire damage effect, and a very cool Ash of War. It's essentially the spin slash, but it creates a good sized puddle of magma in its wake to do additional damage. Which makes sense since the blade itself is made of actual lava. It's described as being impossible to craft for a human, so that leaves the snake men as the possible creators of this weapon, since they're the only race of creatures that is known for crafting weapons out of magma. But I deem this weapon as good, and recommend it to all, especially if you're running through the game with paired curve swords which became one of my favorite playstyles after my first playthrough of Dark Souls 3 where the Cell Sword Twin Blades carried me through the entire game from start to finish and DLC. Next up we've got another weapon I'm really fond of, the Chain Link Flail. <laughs> This is another weapon where after farming it for so long and not getting shit I started to question whether it even existed because you know the pumpkin staff mace hammer thing that they have as far as I know can't be obtained so I figured okay so the flail can't either until I saw a bunch of videos online with people getting it and I was like well shit I guess I gotta farm for it now and farm for it I did after a couple days of endlessly slaughtering the pumpkin head in front of Fort Hate, I finally got what I like to call the sausage links. So this weapon is big, so big that it drags on the ground if you're carrying it with one hand. No homo. It's described as a spiked iron tube attached by a chain wielded by the mad pumpkin heads. Especially large for a flail, wielding it requires more strength than it does dexterity. Since dex is the usual attribute for the other flails besides the two uh, magical ones. This is the closest we get to a strength flail in the game, and it is pretty useful. Something about smashing down heavy jumping attacks with it just feels so satisfying. I can't really describe it other than that. It's just really fun to use. And even the one-handed attacks when you're striking people and seeing it stagger them back, it's pretty, I don't know, it, uh, it feels very impactful, if that uh, makes any sense. And the fact that it's so big also gives it, I think, the most reach out of all the flails, although I could be wrong, since I'm not quite sure how the uh, hitboxes of the other ones work. But appearance-wise, this one is definitely the longest. If you're trying to farm this thing, I recommend not killing the bloody Godric Knight at the top of Fort Hate and just killing the pumpkin head there and then refreshing at the grace point at the foot of the fort. Rinse, repeat till you got it. It might take uh, considerably long, though, just a heads up. There's definitely other spots you could farm it at too, like the camp in front of the four belfries, but I think the one at Fort Hate is arguably the easiest. Lore-wise, these flails and also their pumpkin-headed staffs are likely leftovers of the days of the Colosseum, back when Godfrey was Elden Lord, and the various Colosseums and arenas were open for business. All that came to an end when Radagon became Elden Lord and he sort of, uh, ended the Gladiator games. But after this, the warriors of the arenas found various jobs, some as underground crypt keepers and guardians, and the majority of the unique pumpkin-headed gladiators became sellswords, serving in the armies of the various lords of the lands between. Next up, we've got another good one, the Halo Scythe, wielded by the Clean Rot Knights loyal to Melenia, the Severed Valkyrie. Somewhat fittingly, this particular weapon was only wielded by the commanders in Mikola's army which seems to reflect its ability to cast Mikola's Rings of Light, a more powerful version than the incantation version, I might add, as its Ash of War. You can easily tell apart the knights that wield this one over the spear, as the Halo Scythe has a very unique appearance, and if you happen to get in range, they already start hucking those rings at you. And that's a really cool thing about those rings, is that they have a really insanely long reach. I'd say it's comparable to Frenzied Burst's reach. And on top of that, you can spam it in a way similar to Garank's stone, as long as you've got the stamina or FP for it. This weapon can be farmed the earliest at the Aeonian Swamp, as there's several clean rot knights shambling around the swamp with it. Some of them even rise up out of the swamp if you cross over them. But the fact that so many of them here wield it makes it one of the more easier to obtain items on this list, in my opinion, although I do hear it brought up a lot when it comes to weapons that are hard to find. 
And it's just a really cool weapon that I wanted to talk about. Lore-wise, the Rings of Light were an incantation that Mikola had created for his father, Radagon. And presumably, Radagon was proud of his son for this, and even made his own incantation based on those given to him by Mikola, and gifted it to his son out of gratitude. But nonetheless, Mikola abandoned the Golden Order and fundamentalism as a whole, mainly because it could do nothing to cure his sister Melenia's scarlet rot. This would lead to him inventing unalloyed gold, which is a cool subject for another video. But I think the Halo Scythe is probably one of the best weapons in the game if used properly. The only downside is part of its damage is tied up with holy damage, which is probably the worst damage type in Elden Ring. That being said, I still deem it better than good. And oh shit, we're on the second of the last entry, which is actually three entries. So in the Altus Plateau, there's a village. One that appears to have been ripped straight out of an A24 production, with a bunch of laughing, dancing women, presumably celebrating something. That's right, this entry is about the celebrant weapons. Mainly just the sickle, since it took me the longest to get, but the other ones are definitely worth mentioning too. What makes the sickle so hard to get is that there's only two of the enemies that wield it in the large crowd that many use to farm these weapons at. And while the bone cleaver and the ribcage rake, spear, are both extremely cool weapons in both appearance and use, they're both outclassed by stuff like the iron cleaver, or one of my personal favorites, the vulgar militant's saw blade. The sickle is unique in that it's basically a shodel dagger. It's used to easily bypass enemies' guards. Now in use, it's not always perfect, which is similar to how the Shuttles were in previous Dark Souls games, but I think its rarity and its uniqueness outside of the other two celebrant weapons makes it stand above them. So obviously the best place to farm for these weapons would be at the Dominula Windmill Village side of Grace, and just run up the hill and use whatever giant area attack you have at your disposal to kill all of them as fast as you can, and then run back or die to respawn. Take too long to load! I do think it's a bit ridiculous that the hammer you don't have to farm for and you could just go pick it up in the Altus Plateau off a corpse, but all the other weapons you have to farm for. But it's not exactly unique to this game, that type of shit. Although it is something I would have liked to see them move past. But lore-wise, these weapons were said to be ceremonial tools decorated with many color fabrics used in the rituals of the dancers of Windmill Village. What these rituals actually are is not exactly clear, but we can assume that from the presence of the Godskin Apostle and the fact that these weapons are made of bone, it could be that the dancers lure people into the village for the Godskin Apostle to skin and make a sick fit out of, while the dancers themselves get the bones after he's done to make weapons out of. The women of the village look like they've been flayed themselves, so it's possible they already gave their skin to the Apostle to be its servants. Again, this village probably deserves a whole video on it, but I just wanted to cover the basics. I deem these weapons solid, but not really worth all the farming needed to get them. And now we're on to the last entry, which is technically a double entry, and then it'll be followed by a few honorable mentions. This one takes number one spot because despite having the most widespread enemy type, they're still one of the hardest two weapons to get. You goddamn right. The Noble's E-Stock and the Noble's Slender Sword. Very stylish weapons. They are dropped only by the wandering nobles that are usually found following caravans across the lands between, but they're also found in ruins and in dungeons, hanging out beside cliffs. They're just about everywhere, these guys, patrolling roads. You can tell which ones drop their respective weapon because they'll be wielding it. They stand out a bit due to being completely dipped in gold, and they're much slimmer design. The straight sword looks like a standard slim straight sword, but completely gold. While the e-stock appears to have two rings at the hilt, with what appears to be leaves on them, which is a sort of hint at where its wielder comes from. So all of these wandering nobles are the family of lesser nobles, usually knights of Landell, and because of that relation are able to claim a somewhat lesser noble status, but a noble status nonetheless. The nobles themselves are often described as a pitiful product of unending life, mainly because they left the capital in search of something, but have since forgotten what they were looking for. Which is very similar to in Dark Souls, how after people die several deaths, they eventually go hollow, forgetting little bits of themselves after each death. And it's also similar to Beric Dondarrion from Game of Thrones, which is a parallel I always liked. 
But yeah, these wandering nobles, they forgot what they were looking for. They've died several times, eventually becoming mindless zombies, basically. Little more than that, they still remember parts of their purpose because they travel in order and they don't attack each other. They appear to follow the leads of knights and Kaiden mercenaries. So there's still something left in there. Same with those annoying sorcerers. Those guys are funny though, they use their noble birth to get a spot at the academy and only could ever learn Glenstone Pebble. Pretty pathetic, but but it made me like these enemies even more. I'm particularly fond of the straight sword as a sidearm. Something about how it looks while sheathed on my hip, it looks really cool, I really like it. And I would say I'm about the nobles e-stock, but I've never been one for the uh, thrusting weapons in these games. Although I do like that bloody head lice that the sanguine nobles wield. These golden weapons were made to be easy to wield, so they're naturally very lightweight and don't have really any high stat requirements for them. Probably so these nobles could use the weapons with little to no training. And the fact that they were dipped in gold leads me to believe that they might have been a status symbol of sorts to separate them from the peasants. But I really really like both of these weapons and the best place to farm for them in my opinion would be right outside the waypoint ruins. Yeah, you have to deal with those annoying flowers that cast divine pillars of light. But that's easily avoided and you can take out most of the nobles with one breath attack from the dragon communion incantations. And just sort of repeat until you get the two items. I've only gotten two of each of these weapons in like five or so playthroughs or something like that. So I know the drop rate is very low. And the weapons aren't particularly more useful than any of their alternatives. But this is one of the times where I will argue for style over substance. Because these weapons are just really, really cool looking. And I can't lie, defeating someone in a duel with one of these really makes it feel like you have a status symbol. Because most people just don't take the time to farm for them. I did. Shit, even if you lose, which is something I do all the time, you can at least do it in style. Just an all-around classy choice of a dueling weapon. And I always see comments asking people to trade stuff for these rare items, specifically these swords, usually. I don't think I will. Which is probably because people don't want to take all that time to farm for it, and that's completely understandable. I mean, only complete bastards would spend all their time farming for these really obscure, almost useless weapons. Got more than a few bastards here, who's asking? Such a great scene. I'm not even entirely sure the sword that was dipped in gold would be all that functional. I mean, the gold plating would probably fall off after a couple strikes with it. Anyway, let's get on to the honorable mentions before I ramble on too long. So these are various weapons and armor sets that I've seen people bring up that are considered to either have very low drop rates or just be all around hard to get. And I didn't really have that much trouble getting them, so I didn't want to put them on my list. But I feel like it's worth mentioning them, right? Like, I mean, why not? This isn't all about me, it's about other people too. So the first one on this list is the Iron Greatsword, which is used by the red-maned, leonine, misbegotten type enemies. It can be farmed pretty easily at the Halleck Tree, but I can understand why someone wouldn't want to farm there. So if that's the case, I recommend farming at... Lane Dell before you burn the earth tree, as there's two of them a ways down the street from the Avenue Balcony bonfire. One on that large stairwell with other misbegotten and some perfumers, and the other on the lower level of that same section next to Elden Ring's famous friendly dog. The next one is the Gross Messer, which it really doesn't look that much like a messer. I guess it is a messer sword, but it looks too curved, in my opinion, to be a messer, but still. It's only dropped by a handful of skeletons. I think there's one in Black Knife Catacombs in Lyurnia. I believe the first skeleton you see in that dungeon, so you could just kill him and then run back to the grace and just kind of rinse and repeat and all that. Third is the Stone Club, which is another one of my favorite weapons. This one is easily farmed, in my opinion, at the Hallow Tree, right before you fight Knight Loretta a second time, where there's two of these extremely cool battle mage enemies walking across the bridges there. But if you want to get it a little earlier, you can farm the one in front of the Celia Hideaway near the Church of the Plague in Caled, or the one near the Dominula Windmill Village and Rampart Side Grace, sort of in between those two locations. He's standing on top of a hill or a rock overlooking the whole area and he'll jump down if he sees you. That particular one drops the entire armor set upon kill, so I'm not entirely sure if he drops the club, but I wouldn't doubt it. Next we've got the Oracle's Great Horn. 
Now, I spent an extremely long time farming the one on the far away branch near when you first drop into the hallow tree. And I must have killed that dude like a hundred times and got no great horn. But then I went to go kill the one above that little path before you get into the hallow tree proper where there's all these scarlet rot flowers. I took the path to the right where you jump off onto the branch and then run up and then you get to the top and there's another Pillsbury Doughboy looking oracle with the great horn and I killed him and he dropped it outright first try. So that led me to believe that he was a guaranteed drop for it and that apparently is not the case. So this weapon sucks to farm. I described both of the places and neither of them are ideal and I totally get that. That's just uh, unfun. But this weapon isn't really worth all the farming anyway unless you're a completionist. I mean it has a cool Ash of War but it is outclassed in my opinion in every way by the Longhorn which is next on the list. This one's a bit easier to get, dropping only from the medium sized oracles that wield it. You can find one of these dudes as early as Landell. In fact right when you get into the capital there's one like right in front of you. You can farm that guy into oblivion until you get it and that's probably the earliest you'll be able to obtain this weapon. There's also one pretty early on in the Halleck tree branches but I've killed that one by knocking him off his little platform too many times and uh, missed the drop because of it. It just doesn't seem like an ideal place to get it. In my opinion this weapon also has a much better Ash of War than the Great Horn too. But I can understand some people not liking it. I love it. I love the bubbles. We all know this. This next one is a uh, couple pieces of armor. The High Page set which is a hood and a chest piece. They're sort of like alternate skins of the normal page outfit. So as much as I prefer the regular page outfit because it looks like bronze nobleman fit, this one is considerably dripped out. It switches out the dark hood, cloak, and vest for ones of a yellowish tan color. These high pages are stronger versions of the normal pages and they can only really be found in two places. One of them is in a basement in Landell Royal Capital where he's accompanied by a couple regular perfumers and if you go up the floor I think there's a normal page. And the other is at Rey Lucaria Academy where he is much easier to farm because there is a site of grace nearby. It's possible that these high pages served Radagon and that the one here at Rey Lucaria is a leftover from his time spent there. But that's all speculation. To farm this dude all you gotta do is climb up the ladder in the Church of the Cuckoo located at the Academy and run down the hall. Avoid his perfumer bolts though, he shoots three of them. And for some reason they do an insane amount of damage no matter what. But the last of the honorable mentions is the blue silver chess piece dropped by Albinorix. I'm only mentioning this one because I'm having a hell of a time finding a second one. I spent way too long killing these things during the wolf video and getting footage for that that I no longer enjoy fighting them and I no longer even want a second piece of this armor. And it seems to be that only the chest piece has a low drop rate because I have doubles of pretty much everything else besides that and uh... So this item is dropped by the Albinoric Wolfback Archers, the female first gens, like Latena. The blue silver armor itself was said to have been created, or rather birthed, from the same mother that the archers themselves came from. Which is interesting enough, I mean we know Albinorics are silver based life forms or silver based homunculus, but it's interesting that the same silver is what makes up their armor. But a good spot to farm for this set would be right in front of Ordina at that little ambush site they've set up. There's three non-mounted archers and one that patrols with an extra dire wolf. So definitely watch out for that. You really don't want to have your back to a patrolling Albinoric archer. It's not a not really a good time. But I've ranted about a bunch of stupid frustrating items for long enough. I hope you found this video informative in some way. If you liked it, please like it. If you disliked it, please dislike it. And if you like hearing me ramble on about stuff in video games, then please consider hitting that subscribe button. That really helps out the channel and me out as a whole. I appreciate it. I got a good amount of videos that are about to come to fruition. And I'm not going to start any projects until these videos that I'm working on are done. Because it just keeps putting me further in the hole the more projects I start. But you guys don't want to hear about all that. So without further ado, let us have the outro of outros. I'll never pass up an opportunity to shoehorn in a Yorin reference from Game of Thrones. Such a great character.